Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Join me in the call to worship. Listen up, everyone. God has given us work to do. God has called each of us before we were even born. It was God who named us. It is God who claims us. The light of God's love shines in us. Let's all shine love into all the worlds. Gracious God, thank you so much this morning for bringing us all here together to worship. Help us to be a community that shines your light and your love in the world. Help us to knit our hearts together to do your work in a hurting world. May, us be, may we be peace and love and joy for all of our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Almighty God, we gather here to worship what we have found in you, which is you, love and light and goodness and hope and peace amongst, amidst tumultuous times. You are the treasure we found buried that has given us life, the living water that has given life to our very spirit. God, I pray as we reflect on the ways in which you have gotten hold of our attention and have led us from uncertainty to, if not certainty, at least hope in the midst of uncertain times, well, God, I pray that you will motivate us to invite others to come and see the life that we have found here. That we will be inspired to join in the tradition of the disciples and the apostles and pastors and preachers for centuries who have called the attention of the people to the life-giving spirit that we find in ourselves and in the church communities that we take part of. I pray that we will leave here convicted to spread the good news of Jesus to our friends and our neighbors, or to strangers if that inner prompting pushes us towards that. God, the church, is, the church grows because others before us were willing to invite us to come and see the life that we believe is here in the sanctuary, your spirit that has called us together and, it is, and is calling us to a common purpose and a future that includes restoration, joy, and every good thing. So this morning I pray that our eyes will be open to the ways that we might invite others to this life, to the living water. For those who are not able to come here for health reasons, or for those who are traveling, we offer prayers for them. If there is healing that is needed, God, may you make it so. Bring healing to the illnesses and the broken bodies of those that we love who are not able to congregate with us here in the sanctuary. Whatever our souls or our bodies need, God, we pray that you, by your grace, will supply them. And now join us in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you will, turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. We're going, we're going to be reading verses 29 through 46. 29 through 46. And it reads, The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John, again, was standing with two of his disciples. And he, as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, what, Where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. It was a lengthy text and repetitive. If you found yourself with your attention wandering off as I read it, I I don't blame you. That happened to me a few times while I read it this week. This pattern of Invitation, response, then invitation to new people, response, invitation, response. Jesus meets somebody, they are drawn into his life, and then after he has said, come and see to Peter, Andrew, Philip, you have Philip turning to a man named Nathan a little bit later and saying, come and see what I have found here. This, was, this is a pattern that will repeat throughout the Gospel of John, one of the most noteworthy stories is found just three chapters later in John chapter 4 where there's a woman at the well who Jesus meets and asks for water and he describes living water and then he tells her everything about her that she had ever done and she goes back to her village and she says basically come and see and they turn out in droves rinse and rinse repeat cyclical patterns Invitations to life, response, and then this game of telephone, really, except the message is not lost in translation. But there is one detail in this passage that I don't think I ever noticed until I was reading commentaries on this passage this week. It is found in the 39th verse, just after Jesus' invitation to the disciples to come and see. 
For some reason, the writer of John felt it important to include this line, and it was about four o'clock. Okay. So I could have been 10 o'clock for all I care, or two in the afternoon. I don't really know why the time matters. And so I got annoyed at some of the commentators who were, in my opinion, trying to read more into this detail than was there. And so when I read a commentator that said, you know, we don't really know why four o'clock probably doesn't really matter. I was sympathetic to that until I kept thinking, the writer of John was no dummy. I mean, he didn't have writer's block and just said, I'll write it was about four o'clock and hope the dam breaks. So why four o'clock? There's more discussion on this in the writings on this passage than um, I, I, I have to honestly confess. I knew. I don't think I ever noticed this detail. Some, I would say maybe the majority opinion is um, that the reason why the writer of John felt it necessary to say that this was at four o'clock in the afternoon was to cue us into the fact that the day was concluding and the disciples would soon need a place to stay. And this gives Jesus the opportunity to invite them into the place where he is staying so that they can continue this discussion into the night. You can imagine how it would go sitting around the dinner table, a precursor to what would become communion later. And Jesus teaching, disciples asking questions. So, you know, probably the commentators who think that that is the point, there's a, there's a pretty good chance that they're right. But that's not as imaginative as some of the others that I read about. One person wrote that maybe the time was set at 4 o'clock because like so much of life, it's that space, not quite dusk, Definitely not dawn. The sunlight is coming in more at an angle. The shadows are getting longer. This admixture of light and dark, joy and sorrow, happiness, sadness, good times and bad times. The moment where the disciples met Jesus is that time in the day that symbolically could reflect the way that most of us live our lives on any other given day, somewhere in between where we wish we were and where we are. That it's like the moment at our Christmas Eve service where we talk about the light that's coming. It's just a right, it's almost there. It finds us in the dusk, the dark places. Most of life doesn't live there. It's lived kind of somewhere in between. Well, that's a, that's a compelling idea. But there was one person, gosh, I should have written down her name. It was just one sermon where she connected to this four o'clock in the following way. She said, maybe, maybe it's like those other times in your life where you would never forget that moment where you saw the light or you heard the good news or that wonderful thing happened to you, you remember it exactly what time. I was married 3.30 on a Saturday. Of course, it was printed on all of the, all of the handouts. So, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> I wrote in my original manuscript that it was 1.30 and Kelly corrected me. <laughs> but you get the point. I do remember that Josie was born at 717. I remember that the moment Kelly woke me up for Abel, sorry, June, I don't quite remember. <laughs> I remember 803 in the morning, see, she does. But I remember when Kelly woke me up to tell me that her water broke, I picked up my phone and it was 500 on the dot, five o'clock in the morning. Maybe the significance of this time being named is that the, the writer is trying to cue us in that this was a significant time in the life of the disciples, not the kind of time that you would forget, certainly. And you could see two weeks later, maybe Peter having a conversation where he was inviting someone else to come and see. He says, oh boy, it was a Tuesday. It was four o'clock. I'll never forget it. 
I met Jesus and my life has never been the same. I've had similar conversations with people whose team won the Super Bowl. I'll never forget the way it was when that play happened. I wonder if you can resonate. Have you had that experience? Second week of epiphany. I'm talking about an epiphany where your eyes are opened up to some reality around you that gives you Life, joy. I feel like you can hold beauty in your heart. And it makes sense that after you've experienced something like that, that you would want to tell others about it. I mean, why would you hide the lamp under a bushel? No. <laughs> As the children's song goes, tell the world where am I going with this? Well, there's been a lot of talk in the last several decades, repetitive talk. You read an article about church decline in the 90s, it reads like one about church decline in 2020 or the 80s, really since the Vietnam War. Vietnam War, after that, was the first time that people who were tracking these things noticed this exodus that was beginning. So how do you grow the church, you know? Do you, do you advertise on the radio? Do you put up flyers in coffee shops? One person told me that maybe I should get an agent. You could see, you could, Kelly told me that. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, you know, how do you, Kelly and I are both together in this conversation where we are just, throwing out ideas because you know it's it's hard to know what the answer is and everyone seems to be asking the same question how do you grow the church so I was on a Monday this Monday laying in bed and thinking about this and going over the ideas I was thinking about this event I just announced, Passport to Northwood, and hoping, hoping to get some folks in here. And I was thinking about the leadership council meeting that was the next day where I knew we would be talking about budget and all of the issues relating to that and as it's connected with church growth. And that is what we talked about, wonderful discussion. And as I was laying in bed thinking about these things at like 5.30 in the morning, I put in my audio book, to distract me. And my thoughts are weaving in and out of church growth audiobook, church growth audiobook. And at some point in the audiobook, a biblical passage was quoted, and the gist was this Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And then a voice spoke into my head. I said, it really is as simple as that. The word evangelism has fallen out in fashionable circles. The mainline churches, like Disciples of Christ and other denominations, feel, I think rightfully so, that the word evangelize has been hijacked by Christian traditions that have reduced it basically to this. There's hell. There are people going there. You need to get into their hands and their hearts the ticket out. Fear, get out of jail free card, and then just sort of wait until you pass go, and which time you'll collect, I guess, a harp and a halo. But in the meantime, sit tight. I mean, I remember the way it was presented to me. I was terrified and wondered if I could ever make God happy enough in the meantime. So I prayed real hard, and I was told that in this way, I would find my freedom and joy and happiness. 
So when somebody evangelizes in that sense, yeah, you know, we don't, we don't really want any part of it, especially if we ourselves have been burned, caught in the fire. I, I remember you know, driving in the car, driver feels a conviction, pulls over, knocks on a stranger's door and presents him with this message. That was evangelism and the church that raised me. That is a world of difference from the model we find here, where it doesn't begin in fear, but in life. And the invitation is to the life that the disciples found. It's like, we have found this treasure buried in a field. Jesus would describe it as a treasure buried in a field or a pearl of great price. And it's to that life, living water, good word for it, that you invite people. So yes, I'm talking about evangelism. The word evangelism comes from the Greek word evangelion, which means to bring the good news. The evangelist is one who brings the good news. What could possibly go wrong? So I think that it is time for us to reclaim the word. And when we say saved, Fred Craddock has a great sermon on this, this idea of saved. We're not talking about a get out of jail free card that some wrongly construe as grace, but the salvation that we desire from our addictions, our sorrow, our lack of community, our loneliness, our fears. And when God saves us from that, we can begin to live again. And if we have found it, if you've found it, what I'm saying is that it is time for you all to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in your own words, but on purpose. In your own words, politely, <laughs> but on purpose. When somebody is going through something, tell them about what gave you life when you were in that place and how your faith in Jesus was connected to the life you found in the valley of the shadow of death. Tell them about a place where you gather and the people you gather with that have walked with you through life for decades and invite them to walk along. If you want to grow a church, I don't think we need a sexier church service or better promotional material. I think that we need to evangelize to tell people about Jesus. It's refreshingly simple when you think about it. All of a sudden, the pressure's off. Because it's God that does the work as we tell people about God. So tell all your friends. Say to them, come and see. The apostle Peter did, and it was on that rock that Jesus built his church. Right shining eyes